Welcome to World of Marketing Podcast, a Foster Web Marketing production. Here's your host, Tom Foster. So, everybody, it's Tom Foster, World of Marketing. Today is a great day. I'm really excited to have my good buddy, Kevin Motley, here, who is a litigation attorney. So, that's what you call yourself, right? Litigation attorney? Well, yes. I mean, that's technically correct. I, I, you know, when people ask me, I say I'm a trial lawyer. Yeah. Um, one time I, when I was at a very large law firm, I was uh, talking with a judge, off the record, of course, who also used to be at a large law firm. And he said, you know, we, you know what we called litigators at the large law firms? And I said, no. And he said, we called them little gators. So... <laughs> Because they never tried cases, so I. Ah, so I always, that's why you say trial so attorney. So I always shy away from. You like to trial. You like to do trials. I do. Yeah. I do. So you're in Richmond, Richmond Virginia. Richmond, Virginia, RBA. Yeah, and so how long have you been practicing law? So I started in, let's see, it would have been August of 1996. So we just passed 23 years. Wow. Pretty amazing. You look very young. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I, I can't that. say that about all lawyers that have been practicing that long. <laughs> well, I know. It's, uh, um, I try to take care of myself. Yeah. So. And so you've been, and you said you worked at a big, so tell me a little bit of your story. Tell the listeners about um, your your ascendance to where you are now, and then we'll talk about what you're doing now. Sure, sure. So going back to the beginning, I started at a firm in Virginia, which was, um, uh, I would say the third largest firm in the state at the time. This is 1996, and it was a good uh, old firm. I mean, they had somebody who did s everything. Uh, th they had one of everything, if you will. Sure. And, and they had lots of phenomenal attorneys, just great attorneys in every subject matter. So it was a great place to start my career. And uh, I had some great mentors. I actually started in the real estate law department which uh, I never wanted to do. That, that didn't really have anything to do with why I went to law school, but that's where I got an offer. And so that's the job I took. And I learned a lot doing that. Uh, you know, things work out for a reason, I think. Sure. And uh, I got some great experience doing that. A couple of years into it, though, there was a big piece of litigation going on, and I got pulled in from that. Um, I think people knew that I had a passion for for trying to, to get in court. And even the real estate people kind of knew that. And so they accommodated that passion, which is a sign of a good employer. <laughs> and um, I ended up getting in on that case and then another one. And, and as, as things started to go forward, um, the older partners you know, liked what I could do in court. And so I started getting more freedom. And I actually ended up, due to rate structures and things like that, getting a lot of courtroom experience as a young defense lawyer which is a rarity, really, in a large firm. Um, and I don't know how much of that still goes on. Uh, I happened to be defending the railroads in Virginia at that mm -hmm. time. And, uh, and I was going up against some of the best plaintiff's lawyers in the state on some serious cases. And I learned a lot, cut my teeth. Um, and uh, it was in that context that sometimes the plaintiff lawyer would come up to me and say, you know, you're actually pretty good at this. Have you ever, <laughs> thought, have you ever thought about being a plaintiff's lawyer? And... Uh, that's one thing that sticks out of my mind. That another, was a big change. Yeah, another thing that sticks out of my mind is um, when cases were over, like after a mediation or a settlement, it seemed like the plaintiff's lawyer was a little happier walking away from the case than, than I was. I was just on to the next case where I'm going to try to keep somebody from getting anything, you know. And uh, I enjoyed it. I mean, I, I enjoyed it. But it, it, I, I kind of had a little spark in my brain that, you know, maybe I would want to do the the other side you want to jump at, on the other at some side. point yeah yeah so so we, you did i did i did it, that, that time came and when was that well in 2008 um as as you'll recall uh we had the the yeah. the recession um i at that point was a young partner uh in the successor firm to that first firm i started with and so like the first firm the successor firm Again, an old, older firm, this one from Atlanta. They were, by that time, an international law firm, lots of partners, many associates, many offices, and a great firm. I mean, again, great people in every subject matter. I enjoyed working with them. Um, 
I was a young partner, and I did okay. Um, I did not, however, have that big book of business. Um, I didn't have, and I don't want to exaggerate, I don't think you need this as a big firm partner. I didn't have Coca-Cola as a client, for example, uh, or anything close to it. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I did, however, have uh, some good experiences. Uh, I did okay as a partner, but I would not be what you would call a rainmaker. Um, I was kind of turning into what we call a service partner. Um, if somebody who had a big client that got sued um, needed a partner to step in, I might be called upon to do that. But I didn't actually have the clients. Um, and when that recession hit, I could kind of see the writing on the wall. And on November 19, 2008, I was called into a conference room and I was told, like some other partners were, you're going to have to find another place to practice law. And this was happening in a lot of big firms at that time. Uh, so I and a number of others uh, got that news, and, and we had about three months to, 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 find, to, another to place. find another place. And so I came home that, well, actually, I, it, it happened very quickly, my emotional reaction to that. I stood up, I walked to the conference room door, and at the precise moment I was reaching for the door, I realized I was smiling. Um, because I had been thinking for years about, you know, I'd really like to start my own firm. I'd like to do something different. I'd like to do this. I'd like to do that. I'd like to be more in control of my destiny. Um, and I just didn't have the guts to do it. Yeah. And th that's how life works. Sometimes when you don't have that, you don't have the guts to just get up and do something, y you get a kick in the rear. Yeah. And it happens. Push. It either happens because you're passion isn't in what you're doing and so you're not doing that great um or it happens because things just force it to happen and and uh well sometimes it's necessary it's a necessary yeah. thing that you have to go through in order to get to the other side of something greater yeah and that's the wave of everything that's right came home that night had had a mortgage two car payments three kids playing in the other room and a wife who was staying at home with them not employed and i gleefully said hey guess what I lost my job today. <laughs> and so Trisha looked at me, my wife, do what? And I said, <laughs> I said well, it's, it's okay. I'm going to start my do own. Do what? Yeah, it's okay. I'm going to start my own law firm. Um, so did you think of that on your way home? Or were you already planning that and you were like, thank you for freeing me so I could start that? I really was not thinking of that i mean when i went to when i brushed my teeth that morning and went to work and then had that news given to me i mean i don't know what i was doing i was yeah. probably you know thinking of some case i had i don't right. know but in your moleskin notebook yeah. writing down your yeah. case you, stuff yeah you like my moleskin yeah, notebook i like that um but y you know uh another thing that happened the, the it, it just was really funny how it unfolded in retrospect i mean it of course it was bad news i was sad about it but um, one of the first things I did was call a buddy of mine who was a law school classmate who had started a legal recruiting business out in California. And he, he, he's very successful. And I, I, said, I told him, look, about an hour ago, I got let go. What should I do? And he talked me through it. And he, he actually gave me some great advice. Um, these aren't his words. They're mine. But it was uh, the equivalent of don't jump out of the frying pan into the fire. Mm -hmm. um, don't jump to some in-house job right don't jump rebound to, to some big other big firm right that may have a great case now but a year from now won't mm -hmm. um figure out what you want to do and when he said that the light bulb really went off because i knew what that was it was i want to create something myself so that's how, how that happened and when that was in 08 that was 2008 so i had until my 38 and that's when you did motley law firm yeah that's i had three months to kind of get my act together so I spent the next three months you know winding down my practice at, at the big law firm uh, and starting the basic stuff ordering pins you know letterhead uh, sure. starting a website exciting stuff starting a website um, and uh, and on my 38th birthday I walked out the door and opened up my new law firm so um, with nothing absolutely nothing the day after I found out I was gonna be leaving that I told you about a moment ago some things some things happened um, I walked in I was kind of looking around sulking and the phone rang I picked it up it was a great referral source from Baltimore a guy who had 
um, represented a professional athlete who referred that guy to me in, in prior uh, years for a big case. <clears throat> he called me and said, hey, I got a case for you. And so I just kind of took a deep breath and said, this is going to be okay. It's going to work out. Yeah. And that was my first case. Was and that a friend of yours? Or? Uh, he was a friend, still is a friend. He's. Uh, uh, Did he know that you had been laid off? No. No. Isn't and, that funny how he, that, that and he, works? And he hadn't called me in like a year and a half. Yeah. Um, but he called me up and said, hey, I got a great case for you. Be <laughs> it's like such a validation of, yeah. hey, this is going to be okay. Like yeah. this was meant to be. Yeah. He said, I got a great case for you. It's going to be a perfect case for you. And that was my one client when I opened my new firm was that case. And it turned out good to for be, that client. They got a lot of your attention. Yeah. It turned out to be a good case. So uh, things happen. Things happen. And so, that financed you for a while. It did. That, yeah. Yeah. It got the got the ball rolling. And uh, then you you felt like things were going to be OK. I did. I did. And, and they were. So uh, it's it's been fun. It's been a lot of fun. It, People ask me. I have, I have so many people come up to me who are in big law firms, or maybe they're in house, and they they ask me, and it, it won't always be in these words, but it's basically, could I do that too? Um, and the answer is yes. Yeah. Uh, your story. You were scared. Yeah. 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 Your story is going to be different. Yeah. The ball's going to bounce a little different for you than it did for me, but I think everybody ought to try it once. That's that's. Uh, that's my philosophy of life. You only go around the merry-go-round one time is what I always say. And, Make the uh, most of it. Yeah, I'd hate to go around and not try to do this. So speaking of good stories, I want you to tell this great story. <laughs> it's one of my favorite stories of when you um, <coughs> represented it, represented the great basketball player, Allen Iverson. That's right, yeah. Um, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, well, I did in my in my big firm career. I did have the opportunity to represent some athletes um, and in litigation, and and he was one of them. Um, and uh, we had a deposition um, one day, and it was a long day. And uh, after it was over, uh, we all went down and were having a few beers at the the bar that's kind of attached to the the office building. Well, all week I had been admiring his car, which was a very expensive car known as a Maybach. Um, I think they're somewhere worth about four hundred and fifty thousand dollars, worth more than my half house. a million dollar about car. A, about a half a million dollar. And you're a car guy, so you're, yeah. you're like, this yeah. is cool, man. Yeah, I thought, wow, that's a neat car, yeah. you know. Um, and so I had been eyeing it all week. Well, after the deposition was over, we're going down there. We had a couple of beverages, and his guys brought the car up and parked it right in front of the bar and they came in and asked me hey lawyer you know can we park the car here and I you know by that time I'm like yeah sure his entourage of yeah yeah I said, how sure. many there how many were there <laughs> probably five or six yeah five or six and you <laughs> and <me. laughs> these and are like six foot eight dudes yeah and I'm like sure park the car there I acted like I own the place right sure you're and, the lawyer and, and hey I'm, lawyer uh, yeah after I thought about it a moment, I said, you know, I really don't have authority <laughs> to tell them they can park the car there. So I asked the young hostess, hey, can, can we park the car there? It's a really nice car. Well, she says, uh, actually, they're going to tow the car if you don't move it. And so I go back to the entourage and, guys, uh, we're going to have to move the, the Maybach. And uh, here's my parking pass. You can park the car in the deck. And I, hand, I reach it out. And instead of that, the very savvy member of the entourage reached in his pocket pulled out the keys and just flipped them to me and it was kind of slow motion <laughs> and he said here lawyer why don't you do it and so I caught the keys and I said to myself I'm gonna get to drive the Maybach you know I didn't think about anything else sure just I'm gonna get to drive the Maybach into the parking garage <laughs> So, which I get in the car, and this is back before keyless ignition was a thing, you know, but this car had it. This car had it. And I'm sitting there, and I can't figure out how to turn the car on. Finally, I figure out you just push that button, and it turns on. You know, the seat was way down because all these guys are <laughs> yeah, big. Yeah, enormous, right. And I'm little, and so I can't <laughs> see over the steering wheel. I can't see. I can't see. I can barely see the front of the hood. And uh, I wheel the car around. One of my partners was coming out of the parking deck at the time, and she about 
I mean, her eyes were big, and she watched me go in like, what in the world What's he doing? is he driving? <laughs> you have this shit-eating grin. And that's the first time <laughs> it occurred to me that maybe I shouldn't be doing this. Um, and so I get to the gate to the parking garage, and I try to pull the car in. It won't fit. It's too long. It's like a small limousine. Uh, I try several times. It just won't go in. People are blowing their horns behind me. Finally, I decided, let's just do it. <laughs> I pushed the accelerator, and all I heard was crunch. <laughs> and I thought, oh, my gosh. What, what, <laughs> what have I done? What have I done? So I drove up every ramp in the parking deck all the way to the top floor where nobody was, and I got out to see what had happened. And I had, I had done a pretty good number on one of the rims on the car. So thankfully it wasn't the body, it wasn't the paint. But but at the same time, I I, I had – come to realize that I had damaged my client's car and and what do you do then you got and your client is Alan Iverson yeah you got bad news for a client I'm like well you're his lawyer you got to tell him the the truth so I went down and told him in front of all these guys I got some bad news Uh, I I scratched the Maybach I didn't scratch the car but the rim I tore the rim up and I'll never forget what he did He, he, he took a sip of his beverage and looked at all the entourage members and he said that's the first time anybody ever told me the truth about scratching my car <laughs> <laughs> he used some other words in there he probably but, <laughs> <laughs> but and, and so that was uh something i'll never forget yeah for sure and, that's and, a great uh, story yeah and i did give him a break on his, on yeah. his bill yeah you know? i'm sure he's gotten that fixed uh, yeah i think they got the rim polished out but uh that's I may, great. I may have to. That's such a funny, just the image, the the vision of it happening, yeah. the whole thing. Yeah. That's a good story. All right. So that was back then. And let's fast forward to a couple years ago um, uh, where you're you're now doing, uh, where you do a lot of different things, but you're really specializing in brain injury cases, right. TBI cases. Right. Uh, you've got a great relationship with the amazing Stephen Smith, who is a plaintiff attorney. Down in Hampton Roads. Right. He right. pretty much kind of, in, can we say he kind of invented? I think Stephen is, if not the pioneer, pioneer yeah. in this area, yeah. certainly one of a handful of them in the country. And, yeah, and, and you and work with him, yeah. yes. co-counsel with him on a lot of very successful brain injury cases yes. in federal court. Yes, yeah, it, it, it's uh, he's got a, a big practice, but um, it, you know some of the cases that he has inevitably end up in federal court, which is uh, not really where you want to be with a lot of uh, cases, particularly premises liability cases. If you're a plaintiff, uh, you know, and we're talking about the the Eastern District of Virginia in particular. And so, yeah, when in recent years uh, we've worked together on some cases that have gone to, to federal court in particular. And so what is the difference, because I don't particularly know, I think, but I want you to educate me. I'm sure other lawyers do that are listening to this. But what is the significance of you trying cases in federal court, and why wouldn't other lawyers just be mm. like, oh, it's like anything else? Yeah, that's it's a good question. Well, there are a number of a number of challenges when you have one of these cases going to federal court. Number one is speed, um, particularly in the Eastern District of Virginia. Uh, when it's traditionally known as the rocket docket because yeah. it moves so <laughs> yeah, fast. And, and so the, that's all to say that when you jump on a horse in the Eastern District of Virginia, you're going to be riding the horse very fast, very quickly, and it's going to be spring to the finish line. So you're, 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 compare that to state court in Virginia where, you know, the case kind of plods along at the pace that the lawyers set. It's a lot more sane. Um, it's a lot more manageable, manageable, um, there's less mo- stressful, less stre- There's more time to think about things or not do anything is better. <laughs> the better way of putting it <laughs> in federal court. <laughs> yeah. In federal court, everything happens more quick. It, it just happens quicker. Right. And so you're, you're, so that you're doing everything quicker. You're seeing if you got a good case quicker. You are, um, selecting experts uh, on a much faster pace, you are um, doing written discovery much quick, more quicker, and you're spending money 
quicker. I mean, everything is turned up and it's faster. Do you get paid quicker if you win? Uh, and you get paid quicker if you win. That's pretty good. Yeah, that, that is good. I mean, that's one thing to come back to maybe later as, as a bookmark of why it's good to be there. Yeah. Um, now, uh, that's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it has to do with the summary judgment uh, rules and the willingness of federal uh, jurists to dismiss cases. Um, you know, if there's a flaw in the liability side of your case or some important damages aspect of your case, the federal judges are, um, everybody knows this, more willing to take a look at dismissing the claim entirely or making a bold uh, ruling on a piece of evidence that you really need in the record, they, they might not let you do it. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, for example, the, the, the rules with experts are much more aggressive in federal court as to challenging their reliability. So that's another barrier. Um, you know, another so barrier. you better know what you're doing. Yeah. Another, another barrier is the jury pool. I mean, the jury pool pulls from a larger place. It, it'll, it'll include a lot more uh, different types of jurisdictions in the jury pool, so you don't really know who you're going to be getting. Uh, whereas in state court, you know, if you have a case, for example, in the city of Richmond, you, you know your jurors are coming from the city of Richmond. You can mm -hmm. you can much more um, accurately predict the type of jurors that you're going to get. So those are some of the negatives, some of the barriers uh, to being in federal court. I've, I've heard a lot of very experienced lawyers uh, in Virginia say, you know, hey, if it's going to get a federal court, I really don't want to do it. Um, some of them will not do it at all if it's going to federal court. Some of them, um, you know, aren't, uh, you know, afraid to do it, but it's, it's really... They just a, don't want to do it. It's really a black mark on the case. I mean, there's a lot of lawyers, you know, that I talk to that just don't want to try cases anymore. Right. They want to manage a law firm. They want to talk to clients. Right. But they just don't want to do the trial work. Right. But you like that. You're I do enjoy it. At no. this point in my life, I do. I mean, yeah. I'm... I'm uh, well, that's unique, yeah. I, I would say. I mean, like, you're, you're still a warrior, going up there fighting well i do have in every in every area of kind of my life and my practice i have people who are mentors to me and most of them don't even know they are um and so you know like with the trial practice stuff mark lanier out of houston uh, i just love what he does his his folksy style is very similar to mine so i can yeah you do have a style so i can relate to it yeah. and, and so i uh, I use a lot of his methods um, with trying cases, uh, and then there are other guys who who do know that I consider them a mentor, um, and uh, that goes with the marketing, that goes with the uh, you know personal stuff, and that also goes with the, the trying of the cases, and um, and so I still have a fire in my belly to try cases and you know do great things in court. Are you looking to mentor other lawyers yourself? Um, it, you know, it's not something that I am out there looking to do, but it's it's something I'm willing to do and, and happy to do. I think I think it's it, necessary yeah. for you to do yeah. based on our conversation yeah, it's yesterday. A, that's and right. Your growth. Yes. I mean, you're getting a lot of very um, large, complicated um, TBI and spinal cord injury cases, mm -hmm. and um, you know you. Is it fair to say you might need some help yes. with your practice? Yes. I mean, from some good lawyers. Yes. Um, I know that, you know, we've worked together over these past few years on creating your website and creating this referral experience for other lawyers to refer cases. But you also need some help from lawyers. Would right. you, is that yeah, accurate? Yeah, that is. And I, I'm at a point now where I'm, uh, and I seem to always come back to this point around the time of the GLM summit every year, <laughs> you know, what, what, what path am I going to take from here? Right. Uh, and, that, and what, uh, are we going to hire some more people? Are we going to not do this type of work anymore? Are we going to do this type of work anymore? And that's, that's a great exercise to go through at least, I would say more frequently than annually. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think, uh, uh, you really, as a business owner, entrepreneur, I think you, you, you need to schedule, um, retreats for yourself you know a lot of times we think of retreats we think of all right let's take the team to the greenbrier or the homestead or or up here in northern virginia what is it lansdowne or mm -hmm. wherever salamander you know let's go have a nice 
retreat and think about our business. R- really, I think as the owner, you need to do that by yourself. Exactly. That's um, what I was going to say. Go grab a fishing pole, sit by a lake, and think. Don't do it in the office. Yeah. Don't do it at home. You got to get away. I mean, uh, personally, I'm I'm I take Mondays and Wednesdays, and those are my work on the business days. Yeah, that's smart. Um, you block and, schedule. Mm-hmm. That's smart. And I mean, I'm available for you know whatever, but we generally don't set up meetings with clients those days unless we we need to. But and especially Monday is 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 my. You know, so I work with Connie, and we get mm-hmm. everything straightened out. And she's terrific. Yeah, and uh, well, thanks. And um, by the way, your team, and I tell you this, uh, probably every time I see you, um, is uh, is phenomenal. Um, and I love working with all of them when I when I have that opportunity. I always enjoy it. Um, you've got a knack for hiring good people which says a lot about and there are a few businesses actually who i know like in one in particular i'm thinking of in the richmond area uh that was recently my neighbor in the office building and then they just moved out um they were terrific at hiring people and i always tell the owners or the managers that when i see it because it's such a great thing um to have a just a happy group of people you know yeah and it's not easy to do i credit a lot well you know you want to have a nice culture yeah. And, and, you know, hire people that you like and like you. Right. And uh, get Jay Henderson. I have talked to Jay. Jay is, yeah. We don't hire anybody without Jay Henderson. I'm sure everybody's tired. Of, <coughs> I pretty much bring him up on every podcast. But, at, at you know, it's it's he's just like the, 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 the truth teller. The, he'll tell you about people. And right. Anyway, he's been very helpful making sure that we have good people. Right. And keeping them around for a long time. But So thank you for saying that. And you're working with Susie. Yes. And uh, doing strategic coaching. Yes. Susie um, is uh, phenomenal. We have our monthly calls. Um, and, you know, I can be a bad boy sometimes. I don't get, I don't get my homework Because you're supposed done. to do your homework. Yeah, I don't, I, yeah and I don't get my well, homework done. Well, you're busy. Done. Well, you're doing the, the the most important thing, as I always tell you when you beat up on yourself about that, is that the most important thing that you can do is be a good lawyer. Yeah, yeah. And that's, you know, you do when you're running a small operation, that, and this will happen to you. you. You have a lot of stuff on your plate. Yeah. And you've got to scaffold things, prioritize things, focus. I am a very good person at compartmentalizing. And, and so if I've got a big case coming up, like I have – Right now, um, we've got a trial in four weeks. That's a big one. Um, it's all consuming. It's all hands. But on you're deck. so chill. It's well, and you're so chill. I sleep really good at night. I don't know why, but I do <laughs> sleep really well. Um, and it's it's something that I didn't used to do. Um, but I I'm pretty good at uh, re- remaining calm and. Uh, and, and, and not You'd be getting, a good guy to work for. Yeah, and not getting stressed out and freaking out. And yeah. do I worry? Yes. Do I get stressed? Of course. But um, I've gotten to these points where psychologically I think to myself, what's the worst that could happen? What's the worst that could happen? You know, and and uh, and, and it's not that bad. Uh, no. So the sun will come up the next day. So that's how you have to kind of approach a big case. Just ride the wave. Yeah, but do not mistake that. For me, not um, focusing on that case like a laser beam and trying to squeeze every ounce of value out of it because that's different because than your mind than your head trash. What yeah, you just said right yeah. there, because you're still doing your job and still love, working on the I, clients. Well, case. and my clients know this. Yeah. I uh, love my clients. They know that, um, and I love their story. Yeah, that's what I love about what I do. Actually, is learning what's going on with this person or their family uh, this case i have coming up in november is a perfect example of that such a compelling story and i'm loving every minute of it because the challenge for me is you know i'm in, a, in four weeks i'm putting on a, a a play so to speak a production a show yeah and there are a lot of players a lot of real actors in it not actors these are real people yeah real stories and uh my job, which is a huge job, is to assemble all of that into a compelling theme that that a group of strangers can immediately relate to. Is and that the presentation 
you yes. were showing me last night. Yeah, well, no, that one we just settled. This, oh, yeah, we actually just settled that one. The one I have coming up is actually harder than that one because, uh, but I've come up with a great theme that I'm not going to share right now. It's, no. it's confidential. You tell us about it afterwards. But I've come up with a terrific trial theme that I'm so excited about, which captures everything going on with this family that suffered this tragedy, right. and and um, and I, I can't wait to tell it. Um, and that's that's what gets me really juiced uh, is that. And so when you're done with that case, then you're going to publish the success story about yes, that and absolutely. let us all know about it. Absolutely. So, Kevin, any um, lawyers wanting to refer? Because you are a very specialized federal court, TBI, spinal cord injury attorney, right? right? So right. they can just go to your website, contact Absolutely. you. We have a uh, place on the website where you can actually go that avenue if you want to. to and they can also look at some refer. of your other cases that you've done in the past and yes. some of your experience there. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, we love referrals. Yeah, um, all we, lawyers do. Yes. But this is a different, I mean, like, you're kind of a specialist. So, like, this this guy is, like, the ice man. Very nice, very nice guy and very trustworthy. Look, he just went and confessed to Alan Iverson. He <laughs> wrecked his car. Um, that's good. But uh, if you want to work with Kevin, um, if you want to work with him or maybe even work for him, how do they get a hold of you? Well, go to the easiest way really is to just, just go to the website, to the website uh, www.motleylawfirm.com. Um, it's a beautiful or, site. Or just Google me, and guess what? You made that site. <laughs> um, and, I, and I've always been happy with uh, with what you've done with it. Thanks, buddy. Well, well yeah. we're happy to have you and love working with you and looking forward to many more years to come. All right. All right, Kevin Motley, thank you so much for thank being you. on my show. It's Tom Foster, the world of marketing. Thanks, Cole. All right, thanks. Thank you.